Thank you, Jamie. Um, and I'm really glad to see this conference take off. I, I, you know, Wall Street has been an early adopter of all sorts of information technologies. That's, that's an obvious statement. Um, but open source software has been a big thing here for a long time, too. I remember even in the late 90s, lots of pockets of people using uh, Python, using uh, and P and PHP and Apache and technologies, and even like the first inklings of big data and such. And they wouldn't tell their bosses. Uh, they wouldn't tell anybody because it was Wall Street. And you didn't tell anybody anything about how your operations worked. Uh, and what's been nice to see over the last 20 years is Wall Street opening up and uh, uh, starting to contribute code upstream to, uh, to uh, open source projects and get official recognition from their CIOs and CTOs and such that not only is there a reason to use open source software, there's a reason to contribute back. Um, so that's been really great to see. And one of those places where this has manifested itself is uh, not just in kind of like the, the standards uh, operating systems, the cloud container, cloud uh, kind of movement, that sort of thing, but in kind of new wave technology kind of domains as well, where where things are still being sorted out, right? And it's not just the proprietary vendors figuring this out, it's open source communities trying to make that happen too. Um, so, I, I, so Wall Street has been a really big part of the Hyperledger project for a long time and I've been really happy to see that and happy to see this event covering uh, all sorts of different sides of the blockchain space as well. Um, uh, you've heard a bit about kind of the cryptocurrency side and the public ledger side. Um, uh, and I wanted to talk more today about what we're doing at Hyperledger on more of the enterprise side of blockchain uh, technology. Um, and all of you now have probably also heard that at the Linux Foundation, there's a bit more than just Linux going on. Um, I, I, uh, in fact, the template that the foundation had forged around bringing together uh, two layers of community, one layer being the software developers, giving them kind of a neutral ground to work together, uh, and just enough structure, just enough bureaucracy uh, to make sure people are like maximally efficient with their time and able to ship software that enterprises can trust, right? Uh, uh, but not actually like doing the software development ourselves, instead acting somewhat as air traffic control. Um, and then the second layer being the commercial ecosystem on top, right? Bringing companies together uh, to, to help build their use of the technology and how they explain that to their customers, right? Um, and uh, in the blockchain space, uh, I, what, what has started out perhaps as a, uh, uh, you know, kind of a move from talking about purely the payment side and programmable money uh, and people talking about the blockchain. If you ever hear somebody use the definite article in front of the word blockchain, uh, uh, what they've missed perhaps is that the way people are rolling this stuff out now is as a lot of different ledgers that are specific to a given community, um, a community that might be forged around a set of use cases in, say, the banking sector uh, around trade finance or around uh, uh, payments, uh, but it could also be around a, a community of organizations focused on healthcare, uh, a community of organizations focused on uh, uh, the supply chain. Uh, I'll talk about a couple of examples that, uh, 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 that are using hyperledger technology today, but we're increasingly seeing this kind of multi-ledgered world. Uh, and um, that if, if we do it wrong, that'll be a whole lot of different technologies, a lot of bespoke, small batch, artisanal kind of blockchains out there that uh, uh, end up being pretty complex to manage. If we do it right, then we have a lot of common software underneath, a lot of common protocols between those parties. And that's really what we're trying to build at Hyperledger, um, is recognizing that there are uh, lots of different motives for building these blockchains, building these distributed systems. Uh, 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 and some of those drive architectural decisions that uh, lend themselves towards either particular consensus mechanisms on a distributed ledger, particular approaches to smart contract languages, um, uh, some that may need to be more locked down because they're in a very regulated space very, uh, where the cost of being wrong is very high. Uh, others that are more opened up, uh, more participants on the network, uh, a lesser kind of regulatory or, or contractual relationship between the parties, uh, full Turing completeness is desired in the smart contract system, that sort of thing. Uh, and so supporting that whole spectrum is really uh, 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 where we we've, we've focused. We like to think of ourselves as a home for token agnostic technologies, right? Uh, and that ultimately what we come up with could be used to build a very widespread payment system, uh, but it could also be used to build that network between five banks that people want to see deployed. Uh, how do we support that full spectrum? And in a way, it's kind of like the, the way that the database world never really converged on only one true database. Instead, you have MySQL and Cassandra and uh, uh, Berkeley DB and all these other kind of like points in the solution space. And it probably will be the same way for blockchain technology as well, which is why um, 
at Hyperledger, rather than say, hey, there's one true architecture, uh, like uh, uh, actually, frankly, you have in the Linux kernel, right? You have Linus Torvalds with a very strong opinion and his lieutenants and, and other developers in that community saying, you know, we will, we'll do a lot of experimentation, we'll try a lot of things, but ultimately we're gonna converge on, on probably objectively the right way to build a certain way, approach to file system drivers, to uh, process management, that sort of thing. Instead, at Hyperledger, we said this is still a young space. We still don't know uh, uh, what, the, what the solution space looks like, how continuous is it, can it be solved with one single architecture, or does it require things that are semantically or conceptually as different as MySQL and Cassandra? Um, and so uh, we took a very early on kind of a big tent approach, or as we've called it, the greenhouse, um, uh, and now have 10 different projects uh, within that greenhouse, um, all at different stages of uh, the move from pure R&D project to, to final, finalized in production. Um, two that uh, are now in production and being used in some pretty fun places, and I'll uh, show that in a, uh, a bit, are Fab Hyperledger Fabric and Hyperledger Sawtooth. And uh, I'll, I'll go to a bit depth, uh, more depth on what, what they do and kind of their differences in just a bit. Um, uh, but f overall, five of those 10 are what we're calling frameworks. And these are technologies that if a group of you were to go build a distributed ledger, to build a, a common system of record between yourselves, each of you would stand up a node um, that you'd have control over. And that might be hosted in the cloud. That could be hosted with uh, somebody providing a blockchain as a service service, right? Um, or it could be on your own physical hardware if you really wanted your hands around that. Um, but you'd stand up a node. You'd point that node at, at a certificate authority, which kind of acts like the referee on a football field. You know, They grant a certificate to participate uh, in, in that. Uh, blockchain network. Uh, that would also point you to the other peers. And you fire that up and run, and you start writing transactions and confirming other people's transactions, and away you go. Um, so that's what we're calling a framework. And today, we have five different frameworks in Hyperledger. Uh, again, two of those, Fabric and Sawtooth. Uh, two others that are really getting a lot of, well, actually, the other three are all getting traction in different ways and, and are specific in ways. Um, Indy is very focused on distributed digital identity. Uh, Hyperledger Burrow is an implementation of the Ethereum virtual machine. Uh, and Aroha is this kind of redheaded stepchild from Japan uh, that uh, is very focused on payments and very focused on mobile. Um, and we're still trying to figure out exactly the right way to fit it in, um, but we'll, we'll uh, go into more depth on that in a bit. Um, and then uh, a whole bunch of tools that make using these technologies better. One that's uh, an authoring environment called Hyperledger Composer. Another that's kind of a cluster management tool called Cello, which is uh, being really reoriented around Kubernetes, uh, using Kubernetes as the deployment and management framework. Um, Hyperledger Explorer, which is about being able to browse around uh, uh, your ledger and see how these bits are connected and these transactions are connected to each other. Uh, and then a performance uh, uh, package called Hyperledger Caliper, which is about trying to get to an apples to apples comparison when you char characterize the performance of a given blockchain network. Um, uh, a whole lot of momentum has emerged in the almost three years that we've been around. Uh, December 2015 was when uh, we were announced. February 2016 is when the first code dropped. Uh, and in that time, I mean, we, I think we've done pretty well in terms of building the broader uh, developer ecosystem and the broader commercial ecosystem around Hyperledger. We recently crossed 800 uh, different contributors across those 10 different projects. Uh, uh, some more than others. Some are much more mature as projects than others. Um, but all of them now, uh, uh, all of the ones that have um, been gone to production are now at the point where the contributor community is larger than just one vendor, uh, than just one company. And that's, that's pretty important, because that's part of the reason we exist, is to provide this kind of multi-stakeholder framing around each of our open source projects. Um, Lots of activity out there in, in kind of on the international side as well. Blockchain technology is not being driven by Silicon Valley as much as many of the other technology movements. So for us, it's been important to have active meetup communities and uh, uh, software development events like our Hackfests and, and others in places like Singapore uh, and Beijing uh, and, and uh, uh, all over Europe. Uh, and, and so the meetup communities are truly global at this point. And they're, they're getting together. They're talking about use cases. They're also writing code. Um, we also have had a lot of activity recently in these working groups. Uh, and working groups for us 
Some of them are, are cross-cutting and very technically focused, one on um, uh, architecture, for example, that has published a series of papers on uh, consensus mechanisms, on smart contracts, that sort of thing, to try to weave together these five different uh, uh, frameworks that we have into something that makes some sort of coherent kind of sense. Um, uh, the identity working group has also been very active in trying to talk about how do we reconcile blockchains with the GDPR, for example. Um, uh, and then also some sector-specific working groups that we've launched, one around healthcare, which uh, um, was an essential way to try to reach a community that had lots of questions about blockchain technology and very little background or experience in distributed systems. Uh, and so uh, trying to meet them where they are and, and talk about use cases, talk about uh, constraints. When would you not use a blockchain, right? There's a lot of reasons not to use a blockchain. It's a very slow database. Um, uh, but to try to talk about where that would make sense, that community actually said, well, let's pick a use case. Uh, and somebody said, well, we're in the breast milk uh, uh, donor uh, supply chain business, um, and there's some real problems with the way things work today that maybe blockchain technology might address. That community now has kind of spun up its own kind of software development project around implementing um, blockchain uh, technology, implementing Hyperledger for that use case as a kind of public exposition of how do we build a, something like this? How do we marry the constraints of the use case with the constraints of the technology and figure out something interesting? Um, that's been really fun to watch. Uh, um, but by and large, lots of different fun activity going on. Oh, I should also mention the membership base, because uh, like other Linux Foundation projects, we're, uh, all of our work is done publicly. It's all open source. There's no special rights that accrue to, to members in terms of access to code or participation in the open source project. But we're supported in our efforts by, by our members, right? And so we've grown uh, from uh, uh, kind of the companies you've heard of and expect, companies like IBM and Intel, uh, uh, and DTCC, which I'm sure many of you hear. I don't, nobody outside of Wall Street has heard of DTCC, and I think they prefer it that way. Um, but I really like them. Hi, Rob. Uh, <laughs> and you'll hear from, uh, did you hear from Rob yesterday, or you'll hear from them, they'll hear from you today. Yeah, good, because uh, it's an awesome story. Um, uh, but we've also grown in the form of adding um, uh, kind of really top tier participation from healthcare companies, companies like Change Healthcare, who uh, have a network in production today, processing millions of transactions a day, which from, you know, from a big data perspective is still small beans. But these are transactions that are, are, have to do with flowing uh, uh, healthcare insurance claims from, uh, 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 from, from basically from clinics and doctors to payers uh, and back. And uh, Change Healthcare is part of McKesson, and they process about $2 trillion a year worth of healthcare claims. 80% uh, uh, of all healthcare claims in the United States get touched by their system at one point or another. Um, and so they're in production with the network now. Um, but we've also added lots of other members, lots of geographic diversity to what we do. Um, by the way, in the last slide, uh, Baidu uh, might seem like an odd uh, uh, duck to be there. Baidu is actually uh, doing a lot uh, with blockchain technology internally, uh, uh, as well as deploying a blockchain as a service offering. Uh, and we're seeing um, Tencent and Alibaba all have also launched blockchain as a service cloud offerings in China um, uh, for, for, their, for supply chain purposes and for others. Um, and companies like Di Airbus and Daimler, who are not blockchain companies, they're not even IT companies, but who see that reinventing their business at a pretty deep level. So really fun, fun group of, of companies and even a broader general membership that represents companies across finance across healthcare and all sorts of different supply chain settings. Supply chain isn't really a sector so much as something every sector does. So it's been really fun to see that play out in all these areas. In addition to building relationships with uh, uh, lots of government agencies, uh, nonprofits, uh, 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 student associations, and, and other universities out there, um, uh, both, you know, and, and these kinds of organizations don't support us financially, which is great. The, they support us in other ways. We, we use these as a lever to get out to their communities as well. When somebody like the Produce Marketing Association wants to talk with us, we're like, why? Uh, <laughs> and it's because everybody in the produce uh, shipping business is talking about using blockchain technology as a way to keep the next E. coli disaster from causing all produce from California from being banned, you know, for uh, uh, the entire U.S. market, right? Uh, so, uh, and blockchain technology potentially plays a role in that sort of thing. Um, so let me talk about really quickly about a couple of use cases that uh, we've seen uh, Hyperledger in production today uh, serving real needs. Um, there's a network that's been set up uh, by Deutsche Bank, HSBC, uh, Santander, uh, uh, Societe Generale, a lot of other large banks 
to um, manage the flow of uh, uh, paper related to letters of credit, related to all the kinds of bureaucracy and paperwork that gets involved in getting a container of stuff from one side of the world to the other, right? Uh, uh, nobody wants to send a, a bank wire to, a, to an address uh, and then not see their stuff actually get delivered. So the financial world has set up all sorts of, of intermediaries and guarantees and insurers and export-import banks and all this infrastructure to deal with a low-trust environment uh, when uh, something like blockchain technology can really step in and cut a lot of the complexity and a lot of the different layers down to just a few. And so this network is about those banks helping their member accounts, their member uh, companies, small and mid-sized businesses predominantly, get easier access to credit, establish their history as a good trading partner much more efficiently, uh, and cut the time to issue a lot of this paperwork and documents. Uh, and believe it or not, the cost of sending a container uh, from uh, uh, one part from Shanghai to Los Angeles, uh, half that cost is in the paperwork. And so if projects like this, especially if they start to involve port authorities and, and export authorities and such in the, in the managing that flow, could do a lot to cut the cost of shipping goods around the world. Um, uh, similarly, in the, in the, uh, uh, when it comes to food, there's a, a, a project that IBM and Walmart and a couple of other anchors have, have established. It's now in production. It's called the Food Trust Network. Uh, initially, it's focused on leafy greens um, but, uh, uh, and, and uh, the uh, kind of domestic supply chain around that in the United States. Um, Walmart actually had just announced that they will uh, uh, be requiring all of their suppliers, their tier one suppliers, uh, around leafy greens to all of their stores to be on this network next year. Uh, and by 2020, they think if that goes well, uh, they'll require the next tier beyond. Uh, now, it, if it was just focused on Walmart, then it would just be a Walmart API and you could just build it as a Walmart central database. But even Walmart doesn't have the um, market strength to be able to say, you know, uh, we want this all to be centralized on us. Well, they would perhaps like that, like any business would, but that wouldn't carry the, enough weight with the rest of the ecosystem to make sense. Instead, Walmart is set, setting this up, uh, in, again, with IBM and others, uh, and they're inviting other retailers to be a part of that. They're inviting their competitors to be a part of that because that uh, inc increases the value for, for everybody in that ecosystem. And, and ultimately, the governance organization behind that will have to reflect that kind of diversity. Um, it'd be interesting to see where that goes. Uh, and in China, there's some really big deployments that have been done kind of almost without our awareness or, or knowledge. Um, there's a bank called China Minsheng Bank uh, that has driven uh, the deployment with uh, about a dozen other large banks uh, in China, including CIDIC, uh, which is perhaps the one uh, uh, that, that you've, you've heard of, um, uh, uh, to also process uh, domestic letters of credit, uh, uh, which are uh, basically uh, debt, right, uh, uh, corporate debt. Um, the first day that they launched this in production, they processed uh, 100 million renminbi, which is about $16 million uh, of uh, US dollars worth of letters of credit issuance, and they're now to, up to a couple hundred million renminbi per day. Um, this is a market that, uh, that you know, worldwide processes a couple trillion dollars uh, a day, US. Uh, so this is still kind of a, just a small segment of it, but, uh, but pretty exciting. And that's on Fabric now and in production. Likewise, uh, there's uh, another project that's a startup. They're based in China um, uh, that is built a legal documents blockchain for a number of these internet courts that have been set up in China. Um, uh, these are courts where you can appear, present evidence, uh, talk to a jury, and then get your case resolved entirely online. Uh, um, and there is reasonable concern that you know, the repository of these documents was a really attractive uh, target for hackers. So having a, a document repository that could be tied to timestamps, it could be tied to hashes of those documents where you could get a sense of, is this the complete record of all the documents in that system was pretty essential. Um, so they've uh, been deployed now for almost a year. They have 10 million documents in their repository. All sorts of business legal processes have actually converged to, to deliver this. So that's really fun to see. Um, uh, just briefly on kind of like what's new with each of the different frameworks, um, Fabric uh, was 1.0 like mid last year. So 1.3, which is in release candidate now, uh, is ready. Uh, it's got a, a bunch of uh, new feature support for different kinds of languages in the, in the smart contract system uh, for uh, something called uh, zero knowledge assets. Uh, which is a, a way of kind of having confidentiality around tra uh, transactions. Lots of different uh, parameters you can tune if performance is your goal. 
you can trade off performance for decentralization uh, and get, get, higher, uh, get higher speed that way. Um, all sorts of interesting things. Sawtooth as well, uh, recently was released as 1.0, 1.1 is coming up pretty soon. Uh, and it was the first one to support Solidity smart contracts. Uh, these are the smart contract languages, uh, the smart, this is the smart contract language used by the Ethereum ecosystem. Um, Indy, uh, I mentioned, is kind of our uh, yeah, identity-focused tool. Um, this is uh, a network that's being used by somebody called the Sovereign Foundation to build a kind of a, a global kind of overlay connecting identities across different blockchain ledgers in a way that's preservative, uh, protective of individual identity and of individual confidentiality. There's a big project in the Philippines now to use this to implement uh, a KYC mechanism, but pivoted around individuals. It's kind of like if you had control over your credit rating, your credit history, and could decide who to share that data with and audit that sharing, uh, this is a platform for doing that. Um, I mentioned Burrow. Burrow is our EVM interpreter that gets plugged in to Sawtooth and actually support in Fabric for it now. Uh, this is the only Apache licensed EVM out there. Uh, and uh, it's, it's been a key part of building a bridge to the public ledger community and to the community of other companies built around that. In fact, we've announced recently, last week actually, a partnership with the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance, which is a standards body in the, in the Ethereum space. Uh, I, that we hope to actually use as a, as a basis for finding other projects uh, that are related to the Ethereum ecosystem that we can work on together. Really exciting stuff. And then finally, I mentioned everyone asks about interoperability. If you have all these different ledgers out there, um, doesn't that hurt your ability to, to actually have a really fluid marketplace? Uh, and there's going to be a lot of different approaches to interop and a lot of uh, different backbone ledgers, I think, that will connect uh, and act as kind of a discovery tool uh, between ledgers. But one of our plays here is a uh, toolkit. It's still pretty young. It's called Quilt. And it's an implementation of the interledger standard, um, uh, which is a way to do uh, atomic swaps between these different networks. You want to buy a house, and you want to pay for it with Bitcoin. You really want transactions on those two different ledgers to both succeed or both fail. Um, otherwise, you need escrow and all that kind of stuff. Um, uh, and this is a toolkit for doing those kinds of things. Um, uh, another big win for us in the last year is we put out an educational course on edX uh, that has had over 100,000 people sign up for it. Um, some of you might have taken it and, and seen my face on the videos, and, and I'm sorry for that. Um, uh, but uh, uh, it's gotten really great reviews, and in fact, we are, we've added more content to that. We've also developed some more formal training around uh, managing Hyperledger and saw, uh, Fabric and Sawtooth infrastructure, and we'll start uh, doing developer certification against those standards and a test uh, for a harness against those standards uh, uh, before the end of the year. Um, and with that, uh, that's kind of the state of where we are now. It's really a rocket ship. Uh, very few of us on, the, on my staff uh, have, have gotten a full night's uh, worth of sleep in the last uh, couple of months because we've been uh, on such a, uh, this, this rocket ship. But uh, it's really exciting. And the amount of actual productive pickup of these tools uh, uh, has been great to see. It's not aspirational. It's real, and it's here today. Thank you very much.